Our reading continues today from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14, reading from the Revised Standard Version. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me round among them, and behold, there were very many upon the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And as I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, we are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you home into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, says the Lord. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God. Reveal your word to us this day, that we might have life in your name. Amen. The madness of March <laughs> is upon us. It is marked on so many of our calendars. The season comes and goes, you know, so very quickly. It is one of a kind, an experience unlike any other and memorable in so many ways, nurturing the sincerity of devotion and dedication by those who are following faithfully. The unforgettable storylines the pairings of extraordinary characters, the familiar rituals and colors, and the sounds of music that many will only hear this time of year. Most of us have a favorite, one that stirs in us a range of experiences and emotions, and though it does not happen by surprise, still there is a suddenness in the air that fills us with anticipation for weeks on end. It all starts rather unremarkably as long lines begin to form and we find ourselves standing together, earnestly listening and waiting for those solemn and sacred words, 
Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Yes, the madness of March that we call the season of Lent is here and is nearly over. And that means that we are deep in the midst of being reminded of promises that we need often to be reminded of as we share in stories that confound us into silence while also giving voice to the true source of joy and our deepest hopes. The God who has created us in love refuses to abandon us and instead has promised to redeem the earth by joining us on the journey of our humanity and by walking the road ahead of us even unto death. Often appearing when we least expected, the presence of the divine enables us to see more clearly where we are and forges paths and possibilities for life where we did not know that they could be. As with the author of today's reading who wrote, in the 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, I was with the exiles at the Kibar River when the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. The word of the Lord burst in on Ezekiel, a priest of Jerusalem who was far away from home. And like many of his generation, Ezekiel had suffered the trauma not only of displacement, but of witnessing the city's destruction by the Babylonian Empire in the 6th century BCE. When the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, Ezekiel and his people were left with many questions, not only about how they would go on living in a land that was foreign to them, but also whether God would be with them as they did so. The significance of Jerusalem's destruction was a turning point for the people of God, not only as they sought to make sense of their circumstances, but also as they desperately tried to understand the impact of their situation upon their relationship with God and with one another. In her recent book, Kimberly Wagner writes that traumatic events shake the foundations not only of individual lives, but also of the entire communal structure and sense of identity. Often, the world no longer feels dependable, safe, or predictable. And as a result, questions about God's intention and plan and presence become pressing in new ways. Wagner suggests that when trauma occurs, both individuals and communities experience what she calls narrative fracture. That is the breaking apart of the overarching and cohesive narratives that hold a people together and help them to meaningfully experience the world around them. Questions like, who are we to one another now? And how are we to walk together when the world as we have known it no longer makes sense to us? When the places that we have lived and have grown and have rooted ourselves no longer exist? Where is God when the people and the places that reminded us of God are gone? Is God still there? Does God still care? And can God still hear us when we pray? The priest Ezekiel, along with those in exile with him, wrestled with such questions. And what is profound about Ezekiel's story is that as a priest, Ezekiel did not consider himself a prophet. As a priest, Ezekiel was accustomed to standing in the temple before the presence of God, reciting the liturgy and offering prayers that were familiar both to him and his community. But when the temple was destroyed, Ezekiel, like so many others in exile, began to feel God's absence. 
It was in the midst of experiencing the absence of God that Ezekiel began to feel God's presence again. And it was in the midst of experiencing the silence of God that Ezekiel received an astonishing word from the Lord. The hand of the Lord was upon me, he said, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. They are the bones of the people of God, a people who have known great suffering, a people who have lost hope, a people who feel forgotten and left behind. It is important to mention that before God's Spirit gives Ezekiel a word to speak, the Spirit first guides him through the midst of the valley so that he can see the bones. And after a while, having spent some time with the bones, studying them carefully, Ezekiel begins to notice that there are many, many bones, more than he can count. And what is more, they're very dry, as if to say that they have been there for so long. How hard it must have been for Ezekiel to see and to spend time with these bones. And yet how important it must have been for Ezekiel to confront the heaviness of the people's fears and anguish and to visualize for the very first time the weight of his own grief and despair. But God needed Ezekiel to see what he did not want to see in order for God's spirit to reveal to him what only God could help him to see. It was only after Ezekiel confronts the harsh reality of the people's brokenness and suffering that God begins to speak. And the first thing that God says to Ezekiel as he stands in the midst of the valley of bones is a question. Can these bones live? Ezekiel then gives an answer as honestly as he possibly can. Lord God, only you know. In response, God's Spirit instructs Ezekiel to speak to the bones and to say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel begins to speak to the bones, telling them that God is going to cause breath to enter into them and to bring them back to life. And as he speaks, Ezekiel begins to hear a noise. And as he watches, the bones begin to come together, and they're covered with skin. Ezekiel then speaks again as God instructs him and commands the, word, the wind to give breath that there would be life. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, and there was a great multitude of them. The wisdom that Ezekiel is given here entails a series of promises that point to God's power to redeem in order to help the people to more clearly understand the reason for which God has chosen to be among them. Behold, says the Lord, I will open your graves and raise you up from your graves and I will bring you home into your own land and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and then you shall know that I am the Lord. The prophet also hears God saying elsewhere, it is not for your sake that I am about to act. Let that be known to you. It is not for your sake, but for the sake of my holy name. What does this mean? It means that God both gives and renews life because of who God is. Because of who God is. 
Though Ezekiel and his people had lost hope in the faithfulness and promises of God, Ezekiel's vision is one that enables him to, form, to more fully understand that the source of the life of the people of God cannot be found in themselves, but can only be found in the God who gives life, who is the author of redemption and whose purposes seek to enfold each of us, that we may participate in a plan that is greater than ourselves and any one of us. God's people had grown accustomed to experiencing God's faithfulness in the predictability of a world that they believed they understood. But God's desire was to demonstrate God's faithfulness among the people in a way that they had not known before. Thus the people came to experience God's presence anew, not in a building made by human hands, but in each other, a community given breath by the spirit of a living God, a community that would begin to experience the renewal of God's calling and promises, not in the remembrance of a past that is fading away, but by pressing into a future that is unfolding before them by opening their eyes to see and their ears to hear the weight of the challenges that they are presently facing, along with the opportunities that are already out in front of them. It is only then, by courageously confronting the truth of where we are in the present moment, that both its pain and its potential, that the dry bones of our yesterday become as seeds of a new creation, in the hands of the divine. As our hearts are freed from our former visions in exchange for a vision that only God can give to us. The dry bones of abandonment become the seeds of commitment. The dry bones of resignation become the seeds of renewal. The dry bones of arrogance become the seeds of ministry. The dry bones of inequity become the seeds of justice. The dry bones of bitterness become the seeds of rejoicing. The dry bones of old dreams become the seeds of engagement and healing and transformation. And it is God who waters these seeds with a fresh word from the future a word and wind that tugs upon our desire for life in all its fullness and pulls us ever closer toward the promise that God alone creates and makes possible. Furthermore, God does not ask us to do what we cannot do, but by placing our trust in the God who can do all things, we discover that by the strength of grace, the seeds that God has given us to sow are not ours to grow. They are ours only to plant. They are ours only to relinquish and to surrender. It is the faithful love of God that enables these new seeds to take root and to sprout and to blossom and to grow. So may the God who can breathe life into dry bones give us a heart of soil, of dust, of dirt, into which new seeds may be planted. A heart that is sensitive to the movements of the Spirit a heart that is eager to feel the whispers of divine wind. A heart that can distinguish the sound of Christ's voice amid other voices. A heart that is willing to discover life in fresh ways. A heart that is free to let go of what the past has been and never was a heart that is open to what God's future in us is longing to become. Can these bones live? 
Lord God. Only you know. Amen.